why in the world would early Christians have instituted the Eucharistic service? And why in the world did Jesus insist that his flesh is true food and his blood is true drink? So, what is ritual? Today I'm going to be dealing a little bit with the work of Matt Rossano from his book, Ritual in Human Evolution and Religion, Psychological and Ritual Resources. So, briefly, what is a ritual? Matt says, for example, he may notice that his beer drinking glass is spotty and is crusty and not at all conducive to a pleasant Saturday afternoon drink. So, he commences to wash it. He runs water over the glass. He soaps it up with a sponge and rubs, the, rubs it up the glass in and out, and he rinses it, and he looks it over, and maybe he repeats the entire process if he notices a spot or two remaining. Then he dries it with the dish towel, and so then he is ready for his beer. But that was not a ritual washing. Even though he may have washed it that way 50 times before in the past, or 50 other objects that way in the past, his actions are purely practical. They were designed to achieve a necessary and useful goal, which was getting the glass clean. So a specific goal guided his actions. In other words, he rinsed the glass, soaked it up, sponged it and dried it only as much as was necessary to get it clean and ready to use. And when his eyes saw that it was clean and dry, he stopped. If it had not been, he would have continued. So the only rule he really followed was this. Do what you have to do to get it clean as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Now, if we contrast that to a ritual washing, in the Catholic Mass, the priest ritually washes his hands before the consecration of the host. As he moves to the side of the altar, servers bring him a small pitcher, a basin called a lavabo, and a towel. The priest then extends his hands and mutters a brief prayer. Wash away my iniquity, cleanse me of my sin. As the altar servo drips water onto his fingers, the priest then dries his hands with the towel, exchanges bows with the altar servers, and continues with the consecration. This is a ritual washing. If he was looking to actually wash his hands, there would have been much more water, there would have been soap, there would have been rinsing, and so on. So, you can spot a ritual in the following ways. Ritual gestures are formalized or stylized versions of their practical counterparts. Often those gestures are more stylized and they're more disciplined or more precise versions of their practical counterparts. For example, the gestures of a military bugler or uh, military gun salutes, where the, the stylized motion of the firing of the weapon is more stylized. Another common feature of ritual is repetition. This can be subtle or it can be overt. It can be done two or three times, let's say. So the quiet prayer that the priest says during the ritual hand washing, he says, Lord, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me of my sin. And if you Google iniquity, <laughs> iniquity is sinfulness. And so technical nuances aside, iniquities are sins and washing is cleansing. So the same plea is being repeated a second time with slightly different words. And so there's no need to repeat it because obviously God gets the message the first time. So we repeat it because it's ritual. In the case of a baptism, typically 
involves three sprinklings or three dousings with water. There are a number of other things associated with ritual. Rituals are goal demoted or let's say causally opaque. Causally opaque means that it is unclear to observers what effect the ritual actions are having. So if the priest is supposed to be washing, but he's not using soap and he's not scrubbing, and the amount of water being used is insufficient to clean anything, then naive observers might wonder what exactly the priest is trying to accomplish. Similarly, gold emotion refers to the actor's motivation in performing the ritual acts. What compels the ritual actor to act as he or she does? So, while causal opacity asks, what is the ritual actor doing? Gold emotion asks, what does the actor think he or she is doing? So, we can now summarize what makes ritual ritual. It entails actions that are obviously intentional, yet impractical. The actions are formalized, attention-getting, repetitious, and rule-governed. The ritual performer is concerned with the actions themselves, not with any practical ends those actions might achieve. As ritual specialist Catherine Bell has pointed out, ritual often exists in a continuum. As actions increasingly possess ritual-like features, such as intentionality and practicality, formality, repetition, and so on, we become increasingly likely to perceive them as ritual. Now, we need to distinguish rituals versus routines. Routines are repetitive and possibly even ruled govern in their execution, but there are two critical differences. First, routines are mindless while rituals are mindful. So, routines are done frequently enough that they become empty motor habits, such as brushing your teeth, tying your shoes, making morning coffee, and so on. And you can often spot routines because when you get into a routine, often you will not remember that you did them. And so that's a great example. Just, did I take my medicine? So if you get in the habit of taking your medicine after breakfast, you may often go, did I take my medicine? So uh, I actually, after I take my evening pill, I turn the pill bottle upside down. So then I go in the morning and when I take my pill, I turn it right side up. So often I forget. And so I'll go at lunchtime and go, did I take my pill? Okay, the pill bottle is right side up. So that means I took it. So um, what do rituals do? Well, rituals are resource management. Um, rituals bestow certain benefits by virtue of how they work. Now let's explore the story of Lida Hannafan. Lida Hannafan was born in West Virginia in 1879. After attending both the University of Chicago and Harvard, he returned to his home state, serving as a school administrator before becoming the state supervisor of rural schools. As state supervisor, he made it his, his mission to improve rural schools. Now, in 1916, he wrote an article detailing his efforts in the annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences. And so we have this history showing what he did and the discoveries that he made, and they are very important. Hannafan knew that for parents and community members to support investments in educational improvements, that strong bonds of shared values and interests first needed to be formed. In other words, social capital had to be cultivated. So, his definition of social capital is almost identical to the definition of social capital used by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development that is still used today, and that is this. Social capital is networks together with shared norms, values, and understandings that facilitate cooperation within or among groups. So reserves of social capital imply high levels of trust 
and trust allows people to work effectively together to achieve common goals. So just as any builder gathers first the necessary material resources before constructing a house or a building, such as finances, lumber, equipment, labor, and so on, a community must gather the necessary psychological resources before constructing social change. So Hannafan describes how social capital was built up in his rural West Virginia school district using regular community meetings. So Hannafan uh, appointed his district supervisor, Mr. Lloyd Justin, to require teachers to hold recurrent meetings in their schoolhouses to build rapport with parents, families, and community members. Now here's a sample agenda from one of the meetings. The meetings open with a song led by the school choir, followed by a devotion, an address by the teacher, a reading by one of the pupils, followed by a report on current events from a pupil, an essay read by a pupil, another song led by the school choir, another pupil reading, a vocal solo led by a local soloist, another pupil reading, a brief debate, a cornet solo by a local citizen, and a social half hour. So, after doing these for some time, The benefits were numerous and laudatory. A 14% increase in student attendance across the district. The establishment of evening literacy classes addressing the district's high adult illiteracy rate. Free expert lectures given at various schools addressing practical topics of local interest, such as improvements in agricultural, roads, sanitation, and morals, fundraising activities for improvements to local libraries, and the establishment of a district baseball league credited with encouraging greater social attendance. So, what does ritual have to do with any of this? Well, see, the thing is, is that Gathering people together in and of itself in no way ensures a positive outcome. Social interactions can flop as surely as they can succeed. And so we're all too familiar with this. A dumb joke, an unintentionally offensive comment, forgetting to say thanks, ignoring someone without realizing it, and so forth, are all countless ways that we can botch encounters. Ritualizing reduces the probability of mucking things up by scripting the interaction. So, we follow the script, and then we can all sit together, and we can all get along, and then when it's over, we've had a good social interaction, right? In 1995, William McNeil was one of the first to describe how engaging in communal dancing, chanting, or marching produced a euphoric mental state leading to what he called muscular bonding among participants. Indeed, for centuries, armies have used march and drill for creating solidarity among recruits from sometimes widely diverse backgrounds. Okay? Laboratory studies have confirmed that ritualized actions involving synchronized movements facilitate joint cooperative endeavors. And then Rosano lists a number of different studies. Valdesolo, Uyang, and Desteno, 2010, had participants either move in synchrony or asynchronously, after which they performed joint tasks. The task required participants to hold opposite ends of a wooden labyrinth and collaboratively guide a steel ball down a winding pathway as quickly as possible. Successful completion of the task required sensitivity and responsiveness to each other's actions. Those who moved in synchrony proved to be more effective partners than those who did not. 
Ritual improves social bonding. So, people who move together tended to like each other more, perceive one another as more similar, to trust each other more, to empathize, empathize more with one another, and to believe they shared the same values and were more willing to extend compassion and co cooperation to each other. This was a study by Fisher, Calendar, Reddish, and Bulbulia in 2013. And other studies have demonstrated the same thing. Hoven Rosen, Hoven Risen, 2009, Lang, Shaw, Reddish, Wallet, Mitkaitis, and Zygalatas in 2015, and so on. So powerful is the effect of synchronized movement that it can create a stronger sense of social cohesion than other potential unifying factors such as skin color, and that's the Lakin's 2010 study. Laboratory studies have been complemented by field research, which has largely drawn the same conclusion, which is that moving together is bonding together. In one well-known study, Fisher et al., 2013, nine different communities totaling 113 participants in Wellington, New Zealand, were identified that engaged in different types of ritual activities. For some, their ritual activities involved what the authors called exact synchrony, that is, movements and our vocalizations done in unison. These included yoga, kirtan, or Hindu devotional singing, Buddhist chanting, and so on. Other groups engaged in complementary synchrony, where movements were not necessarily in unison, but they complemented one another in the pursuit of a shared goal such as dancing. These included martial arts, a drumming group, a choir, and a Christian church service. Finally, there were two control groups that engaged in activities that were neither synchronized nor complementary, but involved multiple individuals active together for about the same amount of time as the other two groups, approximately 30 minutes, a running group, a social poker group, and so on. So, experimenters measured four aspects of prosociality. Generosity, measured using an economic gain. Intitativity, or the degree of unity individuals felt with other in-group members. Sacred values, or the extent to which the ritual activity represented transcendent values, or values that should not be violated. And four, in-group trust. On all four pro-social measures, groups engaging in synchronized ritual activity had significantly higher scores compared to other groups. On intitativity, the unity individuals felt with other members, both the, both the exact and the complementary synchrony groups were significantly higher than the controls. Furthermore, on both trust and sacred values, the complementary groups were significantly lower than the syn synchronous groups, but higher than the controls. Bottom line, both synchronous and complementary ritual movements produce increased prosociality compared to non-ritual movements. Of the two, however, synchronous movements have stronger effects than complementary. Further analyses have demonstrated that the link with sacred values was especially important to cooperation. The authors argued that ritual activities, especially those involving synchronous movements, produced profound feelings of group unity, intensifying a sense of shared sacred values among group members, ultimately leading to cooperative behaviors. Note well the sequence of events. Ritual activity, the building of in-group unity, the sharing of sacred values, followed by cooperative actions. Cooperative actions is the culmination or product of a sequence of preceding steps beginning with ritual activity. So, we can go on and on and on with this. There's an entire book here of, of, of evidence. But I want to point out something 
that's very, very important. John chapter 6, verse 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at it, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you that do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who those were that did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed, and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was to betray him. So, why is it that Jesus insists that we must eat the bread and drink the wine? Why does he insist that his flesh is true food and his blood true drink? And why is it that the early church up to the present day insists that we must participate in the Eucharistic service. I think it's because Jesus knows that we must perform these rituals together, and that if we do not participate in the rituals together, then we're not going to get the gifts. So, what I'm saying is, is that ritual fills the storehouse Matthew 6.19 Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Luke 12, 13 through 21. One of the multitude said to him, Teacher, bid my brother divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of all covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, 
the land of a rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is he who lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. So, guys, here's the thing about ritual. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to follow the rules. You don't need to even really believe anything to start with. You just have to participate in the ritual. And as we've seen by the scientific evidence that we've presented at the beginning, when you perform a ritual, you receive heavenly things. You receive the benefits. So you receive the social assets. You receive the benefits of ritual unbidden. They come to you as a matter of grace. All you have to do is participate in the ritual, and everyone who participates gains those benefits. Social capital is what's in the storehouse. Cooperation. It, it smooths over our differences. It bonds us together. And I would go so far as to posit that that's what the problem is in the world today, is that the rituals are gone. They're, they're disappearing rapidly. And that if we performed rituals together, then we would begin to build up our social capital and we'd begin moving forward. Thanks for watching. Take care.